the United States emergency broadcast system with a message about decontamination. When a nuclear weapon is detonated near the surface of the earth, great amounts of surface materials, such as soil and debris, are drawn up into the radioactive cloud. The radioactive elements produced by the explosion become incorporated with the particles of soil and debris. The radioactive particles thus formed descend to the earth and are known as fallout. The rate at which fallout particles return to the earth and the distance they are borne aloft depend upon many factors. One factor is the size of the particles. Larger particles are of course heavier and will fall to earth closer to the point of burst than smaller particles. Atmospheric conditions such as rain or snow and wind speed and direction at different altitudes are also factors. It is important to understand that fallout is not a mysterious, invisible, or unrecognizable substance that strikes without warning. Fallout particles are produced in sizes ranging from those that individually can be seen easily to very small particles that appear as fine dust. They vary in color. Some particles are black, some are gray, and others are brown. The larger particles are the most radioactive and present the greatest hazard. The very small particles are a smaller hazard, but they still give off dangerous amounts of radiation. Radiological instruments are needed to detect the presence of the very small particles. People can protect themselves against fallout and have a good chance of surviving it by staying inside a fallout shelter. Do not go outdoors until you receive official notice that it is safe to do so. If fallout particles are detected on persons or supplies, simple decontamination procedures should be used to remove the particles. Remember, radiation is not contagious. A person who has been exposed to radiation cannot infect anyone else. Once the radiation particles have been removed, the exposure to their radiation will be removed. People should understand that the presence of fallout particles on a person or object does not make him or it radioactive. Removal of the fallout particles removes any possible radiation hazard to others from the formerly contaminated person or object. Combs and brushes can be used effectively to remove radioactive particles from people and their clothing. If combs or brushes are not available, brush off the particles with your hands. Brush off shoes and shake or brush clothing at the entrance of the shelter area. Brush, wipe thoroughly, or wash contaminated portions of the skin and hair. If small amounts of fallout penetrate a shelter opening, they can be swept out as sand might be. Civil defense supplies of food and water stocked in a public fallout shelter will not require decontamination. Should you find fallout particles on other food and water supplies, simple procedures should be followed to remove the particles. Fallout on food should be treated much as any grit or sand that you might find on your food at the beach, for instance. Remove as many of the particles as possible before consuming the food. Fallout on food does not make the food radioactive. The important thing is to get rid of the fallout particles. Brush them off or if you can, wash them off. Or if it is a fruit or vegetable, peel the outside skin or layer off. Whatever's inside is fine. If uncontaminated food is available, consume it first. If all the available food is contaminated and people are hungry, serve this food after decontaminating as thoroughly as possible. Do the same with water as you do with food. Serve uncontaminated water first, if available. Apply simple decontamination procedures to water, which contains fallout particles. One way is to filter water through paper towels or layers of fine cloth. Another way is to allow the water to stand until the particles settle to the bottom. Then siphon off the water on top. Boiling or chlorination will not remove fallout contamination. It will, of course, remove other contamination caused by germs. If necessary, if it is the only water available, serve water if it is drinkable, even though it may contain some fallout particles. Just don't drink the particles which settle to the bottom of a container. 
I repeat, it is important to understand that fallout is not a mysterious, invisible, or unrecognizable substance that strikes without warning. Fallout particles are produced in sizes ranging from those that individually can be seen easily to very small particles that appear as fine dust. They vary in color. Some particles are black, some are gray, and others are brown. The larger particles are the most radioactive and present the greatest hazard. The very small particles are a smaller hazard, but they still give off dangerous amounts of radiation. Radiological instruments are needed to detect the presence of the very small particles. People can protect themselves against fallout and have a good chance of surviving it by staying inside a fallout shelter. Do not go outdoors until you receive official notice that it is safe to do so. If fallout particles are detected on persons or supplies, simple decontamination procedures should be used to remove the particles. Remember, Radiation is not contagious. A person who has been exposed to radiation cannot infect anyone else. Once the radiation particles have been removed, the exposure to their radiation will be removed. People should understand that the presence of fallout particles on a person or object does not make him or it radioactive. Removal of the fallout particles removes any possible radiation hazard to others from the formerly contaminated person or object. Combs and brushes can be used effectively to remove radioactive particles from people and their clothing. If combs or brushes are not available, brush off the particles with your hands. Brush off shoes and shake or brush clothing at the entrance of the shelter area. Brush, wipe thoroughly, or wash contaminated portions of the skin and hair. If small amounts of fallout penetrate a shelter opening, they can be swept out as sand might be. Civil defense supplies of food and water stocked in a public shelter will not require decontamination. Should you find fallout particles on other food and water supplies, simple procedures should be followed to remove the particles. Fallout on food should be treated much as any grit or sand that you might find on your food at the beach, for instance. Remove as many of the particles as possible before consuming the food. Fallout on food does not make the food radioactive. The important thing is to get rid of the fallout particles. Brush them off, or if you can, wash them off. Or if it is a fruit or vegetable, peel the outside skin or layer off. Whatever's inside is fine. If uncontaminated food is available, consume it first. If all the available food is contaminated and people are hungry, serve this food after decontaminating it as thoroughly as possible. Do the same with water as you do with food. Serve uncontaminated water first, if available. Apply simple decontamination procedures to water, which contains fallout particles. One way is to filter water through paper towels or layers of fine cloth. Another way is to allow the water to stand until the particles settle to the bottom. Then siphon off the water on top. Boiling or chlorination will not remove fallout contamination. It will, of course, remove other contamination caused by germs. If necessary, if it is the only water available, serve water if it is drinkable, even though it may contain some fallout particles. Just don't drink the particles which settle to the bottom of a container. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message about artificial respiration. If a person has stopped breathing, there is no more important life-saving action than to get air into the person's lungs quickly. Start artificial respiration immediately. Whenever possible, mouth-to-mouth -mouth respiration should be used. Perhaps you should be prepared to make some notes on the information that will follow. If you need a pencil and paper now, we will pause for a moment. Place the person on his back and loosen his collar. Open his mouth and with your fingers remove any food or foreign matter. 
Remove also any false teeth. Tilt his head back so that the chin points upward. Lift the lower jaw from behind and underneath so that it juts out. This will move his tongue so that it does not block the air passage. Keep the person's head tilted with one hand and with the other, pinch the nostrils to prevent air from escaping. Open your mouth as wide as possible and place it tightly over the person's mouth so that mouth-to-mouth -mouth contact is tightly sealed. Take a deep breath and blow a good lungful of air into the patient's mouth. Remove your mouth and take another deep breath and repeat the procedure. For an adult person, blow a good breath into his mouth every five seconds or 12 times per minute. If the person is a child, blow small puffs of air into him about 20 times per minute. Do not rupture his lungs by blowing too much air. Watch for his chest to rise to make sure he's getting the right amount of air with each puff. Watch the person's chest to see if it rises. If it does not, recheck to be sure the head is tilted well back and the jaw juts out. If necessary, reach way back in the person's throat to dislodge any foreign matter. Normal breathing should start within 15 minutes, but if it doesn't, you should continue the procedure for at least two hours. First signs of normal breathing may be a twitching of the fingers or sighing. If the breathing is irregular at first, continue until regular breathing occurs. Even if there is no response, continue until you are certain the person is dead. Have the death confirmed by someone who is competent to do so. I will repeat these instructions. Place the person on his back and loosen his collar. Open his mouth and with your fingers remove any food or foreign matter. Remove also any false teeth. Tilt his head back so that the chin points upward. Lift the lower jaw from behind and underneath so that it juts out. This will move his tongue so that it does not block the air passage. Keep the person's head tilted with one hand and with the other Pinch the nostrils to prevent air from escaping. Open your mouth as wide as possible and place it tightly over the person's mouth so that mouth-to-mouth -mouth contact is tightly sealed. Take a deep breath and blow a good lungful of air into the patient's mouth. Remove your mouth and take another deep breath and repeat the procedure. For an adult person, blow a good breath into his mouth every five seconds or 12 times per minute. If the person is a child, blow small puffs of air into him about 20 times per minute. Do not rupture his lungs by blowing too much air. Watch for his chest to rise to make sure he is getting the right amount of air with each puff. Watch the person's chest to see if it rises. If it does not, recheck to be sure the head is tilted well back and the jaw juts out. If necessary, reach way back in the person's throat to dislodge any foreign matter. Normal breathing should start within 15 minutes, but if it doesn't, you should continue the procedure for at least two hours. First signs of normal breathing may be a twitching of the fingers or sighing. If the breathing is irregular at first, Continue until regular breathing occurs. Even if there is no response, continue until you are certain the person is dead. Have the death confirmed by someone who is competent to do so. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message about first aid treatment for bleeding. For people suffering from open wounds, Next to restoration of breathing, control of bleeding is most important. You should be prepared to make some notes on the information that will follow. If you need to get a pencil and paper now, we will pause for a moment.
Most bleeding can be controlled by relatively simple measures. One of the best means is by direct pressure applied firmly over the wound. A sterile dressing placed over the wound to cover it before pressure is applied helps to prevent infection. If sterile gauze is not obtainable, use the cleanest material you can find, a fresh handkerchief, a strip torn from a sheet, shirt, or slip, or a sanitary napkin. If no cloth is available, use your bare hands. A severe wound can require firm pressure for a substantial period of time to stop the flow of blood. Have the person lie down if possible. Remove clothing from the vicinity of the wound so as to see the extent of the damage and enable you to work on the wound directly. To reduce the chances of infection, tear or cut clothing away rather than pulling it over the wound. If it is cold, do not destroy clothing unnecessarily. If the wound is on the arm or leg and bleeding continues, place the person flat on his back with the wounded arm or leg raised. If blood soaks through the dressing, do not remove it, but apply an additional dressing and more pressure. When the bleeding has stopped, put a cloth bandage over the dressing to hold it firmly in place. The bandage should be tight enough to keep pressure on the wound, but not so tight that it cuts off the circulation. Check the bandage periodically and loosen it if necessary. If the pressure method does not stop the bleeding, you may have to apply a tourniquet. Caution! Do not use a tourniquet unless it is impossible to stop excessive, life-threatening bleeding by any other method. Once applied, a tourniquet should not be removed except by competent personnel. If a tourniquet is applied, someone must stay with the person. Because of the pain, he may release it himself and start bleeding again. To apply a tourniquet, use a flat piece of material about two inches wide. It might be a bandage, stocking, belt, or necktie. Do not use rope or wire or cord. They can injure tissues and blood vessels. Always place the tourniquet between the wound and the heart. Injuries to the chest or abdomen can cause internal bleeding, which may be determined from bruises and complaints of pain. There is little you can do beyond having the patient lie still. Keep him warm. If he lies still, the bleeding may stop. If you have a publication on first aid available, refer to it. I will repeat these instructions. Most bleeding can be controlled by relatively simple measures. One of the best means is by direct pressure applied firmly over the wound. A sterile dressing placed over the wound to cover it before pressure is applied helps to prevent infection. If you have no sterile gauze, use the cleanest material you can find, a fresh handkerchief, a strip torn from a sheet, shirt, or slip, or a sanitary napkin. If no cloth is available, use your bare hands. A severe wound can require firm pressure for a substantial period of time to stop the flow of blood. Have the person lie down if possible. Remove clothing from the vicinity of the wound so as to see the extent of the damage and enable you to work on the wound directly. Tear or cut clothing away rather than pulling it over the wound to reduce the chances of infection. If it is cold, do not destroy clothing unnecessarily. If the wound is on the arm or leg and bleeding continues, place the person flat on his back with the wounded arm or leg raised. If blood soaks through the dressing, do not remove it, but apply an additional dressing and more pressure. When the bleeding has stopped, put a cloth bandage over the dressing to hold it firmly in place. The bandage should be tight enough to keep pressure on the wound but not so tight that it cuts off the circulation. Check the bandage periodically and loosen it if necessary. If the pressure method does not stop the bleeding, you may have to apply a tourniquet. Caution! Do not use a tourniquet unless it is impossible to stop excessive, life-threatening bleeding by any other method. 
once applied, a tourniquet should not be removed except by competent personnel. If a tourniquet is applied, someone must stay with the person. Because of the pain, he may release it himself and start bleeding again. To apply a tourniquet, use a flat piece of material about two inches wide. It might be a bandage, stocking, belt, or necktie. Do not use rope or wire or cord. They can injure tissues and blood vessels. Always place the tourniquet between the wound and the heart. Injuries to the chest or abdomen can cause internal bleeding, which may be determined from bruises and complaints of pain. There is little you can do beyond having the patient lie still. Keep him warm. If he lies still, the bleeding may stop. If you have a publication on first aid available, refer to it. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message about first aid treatment for burns. In the care of a person who has been burned, relieving the pain is the most urgent problem. Cold, wet applications will often relieve pain. You should make notes on the information about burns which will follow. We will pause while you get pencil and paper. The most important things to remember in the treatment of burns are to relieve the pain, prevent infection, and treat the patient for shock. Relief of pain is the most urgent problem. Minor burns can be distinguished by reddening of the skin. Deeper burns produce blisters or destroy tissue and require specific actions. In the case of deep burns, keep the patient lying down. Have his head a little lower than his legs and hips, but not if there is a head wound or difficulty in breathing. If you can, have him drink half a glass of a solution made up of one teaspoonful of salt and a half teaspoonful of baking soda to one quart of water, and repeat this dosage every 15 minutes. To repeat, the solution is one teaspoon of salt and a half teaspoon of baking soda to one quart of water. The dosage is a half glass of this mixture each 15 minutes. The solution may be cooled to make it more palatable. Wash several inches of the area around the burn with soap and water, but not the burn itself. Cover the burned area with a dry, sterile gauze or other clean cloth, towel, or pad. It is better to leave the burn exposed than to use a dirty dressing. If adjacent surfaces of skin are burned, such as on toes, fingers, ears and head, or arms and chest, keep them separated with gauze so that the burned areas do not stick together. If the burn was caused by a chemical, wash the chemical away with large amounts of clear water. In the case of deeper burns, do not pull clothing over the burned area. Cut it away. Do not try to remove any pieces of cloth or bits of dirt or debris that may be sticking to the burn. Do not use antiseptics, grease, butter, ointment, or any other type of medication on severe burns. It is best to keep the burn dry. Do not change the dressing until absolutely necessary. Dressings may be left in place for five to seven days. Remember, first relieve pain, but take all possible precautions to prevent infection and shock. If a handbook on first aid is available, use it. I will repeat these instructions. The most important things to remember in the treatment of burns are relieve the pain, prevent infection, and treat the patient for shock. Pain is the most urgent problem. Minor burns can be distinguished by reddening of the skin. Deeper burns produce blisters or destroy tissue 
and require specific actions. In case of deep burns, keep the patient lying down. Have his head a little lower than his legs and hips, but not if there is a head wound or difficulty in breathing. If you can, have him drink a half glass of a solution made up of one teaspoonful of salt and a half teaspoonful of baking soda to one quart of water and repeat this dosage every 15 minutes. To repeat, the solution is one teaspoon of salt and a half teaspoon of baking soda to one quart of water. The dosage is a half glass of this mixture each 15 minutes. The solution may be cooled to make it more palatable. Wash several inches of the area around the burn with soap and water, but not the burn itself. Cover the burned area with a dry, sterile gauze or other clean cloth, towel, or pad. It is better to leave the burn exposed than to use a dirty dressing. If adjacent surfaces of skin are burned, such as on toes, fingers, ears and head, or arms and chest, keep them separated with gauze so that the burned areas do not stick together. If the burn was caused by a chemical, wash the chemical away with large amounts of clear water. In the case of deeper burns, do not pull clothing over the burned area. Cut it away. Do not try to remove any pieces of cloth or bits of dirt or debris that may be sticking to the burn. Do not use antiseptics, grease, butter, ointment, or any other type of medication on severe burns. It is best to keep the burn dry. Do not change the dressing until absolutely necessary. Dressing may be left in place for five to seven days. Remember, first relieve pain, but take all possible precautions to prevent infection and shock. If a handbook on first aid is available, use it. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message about first aid treatment for shock. A state of shock is a serious condition, and its recognition, prevention, and treatment are important. Perhaps you should be prepared to make some notes on the information that will follow. If you need a pencil and paper now, we will pause for a moment. Being in shock means that a person's circulatory system is not working properly and not enough blood is getting to the vital centers of his brain and spinal cord. Shock may accompany injury, serious loss of blood, or an emotional upset. Symptoms or signs of shock include weak or rapid pulse or no pulse and pale or blue or moist skin. The patient's breathing may be shallow or irregular, and he may have chills or be thirsty. Nausea and vomiting may be present. Avoid rough handling of the patient if shock is suspected. Keep him warm and lying down. Do not apply a hot water bottle or other heat, other than a warm cover, to his body. Loosen the clothing and make him as comfortable as possible. Keep his head level and a little below that of his legs and hips unless he has a head or chest injury or difficulty in breathing. If this is the case, keep his head and shoulders a little higher than the rest of his body. He may be conscious or unconscious. Encourage him to drink fluids if he is conscious and not ill or vomiting, provided he does not have abdominal injuries. If you can, Mix a solution of one teaspoonful of salt and a half teaspoonful of baking soda to one quart of water. I repeat, that's one teaspoon of salt and a half teaspoon of baking soda to one quart of water. Give him a half glass of this solution each 15 minutes. The solution may be cooled to make it more palatable. Do not give him alcoholic drinks of any kind. Remember, 
First restore breathing, then stop bleeding, and then treat for shock. All seriously injured persons should be treated for shock, even though they may appear to be normal or alert. Sometimes persons go into shock without having any physical injuries. If you take prompt action, you may be able to prevent shock or reduce its severity if it does occur. Early action may save a life. If there are first aid publications available, refer to them. I will repeat these instructions. Being in shock means that a person's circulatory system is not working properly and not enough blood is getting to the vital centers of his brain and spinal cord. Shock may accompany injury, serious loss of blood, or an emotional upset. Symptoms or signs of shock include weak or rapid pulse or no pulse and pale or blue or moist skin. The patient's breathing may be shallow or irregular and he may have chills or be thirsty. Nausea and vomiting may be present. Avoid rough handling of the patient if shock is suspected. Keep him warm and lying down. Do not apply a hot water bottle or other heat other than a warm cover to his body. Loosen the clothing and make him as comfortable as possible. Keep his head level and a little below that of his legs and hips unless he has a head or chest injury or has difficulty in breathing. If this is the case, keep his head and shoulders a little higher than the rest of his body. He may be conscious or unconscious. Encourage him to drink fluids if he is conscious and not ill or vomiting, provided he does not have abdominal injuries. If you can, mix a solution of one teaspoonful of salt and a half teaspoonful of baking soda to one quart of water. I repeat, that's one teaspoon of salt and a half teaspoon of baking soda to one quart of water. Give him a half glass of this solution each 15 minutes. The solution may be cooled to make it more palatable. Do not give him alcoholic drinks of any kind. Remember, first restore breathing, then stop bleeding, and then treat for shock. All seriously injured persons should be treated for shock even though they may appear to be normal or alert. Sometimes persons go into shock without having any physical injuries. If you take prompt action, you may be able to prevent shock or reduce its severity if it does occur. Early action may save a life. If there are first aid publications available, refer to them. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message about first aid for radiation sickness. Radiation sickness is not contagious. One person cannot catch it from another. It is perfectly safe to care for a victim. Early symptoms of radiation sickness are loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, weakness, and headache. Other illnesses can produce these complaints, and in the early stages it may be difficult to distinguish between radiation sickness and other illnesses. In public fallout shelters, the degree of exposure to radiation can be determined by using the instruments found in the radiation detection kit. Late signs of radiation sickness will appear in a period anywhere from a few days after exposure up to two weeks. These signs are a sore mouth, bleeding gums, bleeding under the skin, loss of hair, and diarrhea. There is no special medicine for radiation sickness. You can relieve the anxiety and the complaints as they appear. Keep the patient's breathing and stop any bleeding. If the patient has headache or general discomfort, give him one or two aspirin tablets every three or four hours. For a child under 12, give only one tablet every three or four hours. Infants under three months should not be given aspirin at all. If a patient's mouth becomes sore or his gums bleed, try to have him rinse his mouth for comfort. A mouthwash, plain water, 
or a salt solution can be used for this purpose. For a large number of patients with the same problem, make up a quantity of mouthwash using a proportion of a half teaspoon of salt to one quart of water. I repeat, that's a half teaspoon of salt to one quart of water. If a patient has been vomiting or has diarrhea, he should be encouraged but never forced to sip several glasses of a salt and soda solution. To mix the solution, add one teaspoon of salt and a half teaspoon of baking soda to one quart of water. The patient should drink this solution slowly. If the patient continues to vomit, do not give him any more liquids until the vomiting stops. Then he can be given fruit juices, bouillon, or water. The patient should not be forced to eat solid food. For diarrhea, give a mixture of kaolin and pectin if available. The dose should be four teaspoons of the mixture after each bowel movement until the diarrhea is controlled, but do not give more than two doses per hour. Civil Defense medical kits stocked in public fallout shelters contain supplies of kaolin and pectin. In general, keep the patient lying down, resting, and as comfortable as you can. I will repeat these instructions. Radiation sickness is not contagious. One person cannot catch it from another. It is perfectly safe to care for a victim. Early symptoms of radiation sickness are loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, weakness, and headache. Other illnesses can produce these complaints, and in the early stages it may be difficult to distinguish between radiation sickness and other illnesses. In public fallout shelters, the degree of exposure to radiation can be determined by using the instruments found in the radiation detection kit. Late signs of radiation sickness will appear in a period anywhere from a few days after exposure up to two weeks. These signs are a sore mouth, bleeding gums, bleeding under the skin, loss of hair, and diarrhea. There is no special medicine for radiation sickness. You can relieve the anxiety and the complaints as they appear. Keep the patient's breathing and stop any bleeding. If the patient has headache or general discomfort, give him one or two aspirin tablets every three or four hours. For a child under 12, give only one tablet every three or four hours. Infants under three months should not be given aspirin at all. If a patient's mouth becomes sore or his gums bleed, try to have him rinse his mouth for comfort. A mouthwash, plain water, or a salt solution can be used for this purpose. For a large number of patients with the same problem, make up a quantity of mouthwash using a proportion of a half teaspoon of salt to one quart of water. I repeat, that's a half teaspoon of salt to one quart of water. If a patient has been vomiting or has diarrhea, he should be encouraged but never forced to sip several glasses of a salt and soda solution. To mix the solution, add one teaspoon of salt and a half teaspoon of baking soda to one quart of water. To repeat, one teaspoon of salt and a half teaspoon of baking soda to one quart of water. The patient should drink this solution slowly. If the patient continues to vomit, do not give him any more liquids until the vomiting stops. Then he can be given fruit juices, bouillon, or water. The patient should not be forced to eat solid food. For diarrhea, give a mixture of kaolin and pectin if available. The dose should be four teaspoons of the mixture after each bowel movement until the diarrhea is controlled, but do not give more than two doses per hour. Civil Defense medical kits stocked in public fallout shelters contain supplies of kaolin and pectin. In general, keep the patient lying down, resting, and as comfortable as you can.
This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message from the Emergency Health Service to local government officials about reporting communicable diseases. Local government officials and local health officers will report promptly any outbreaks of communicable diseases to the state health officer so he can take effective action. I repeat, this is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message from the Emergency Health Service to local government officials about reporting communicable diseases. Local government officials and local health officers will report promptly any outbreaks of communicable diseases to the state health officer so he can take effective action. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message about emergency mail service and how it will help to reunite separated families. If because of the emergency you become separated from or do not know the whereabouts of family members, relatives, employers, employees, or government agencies, business or welfare institutions, and others whom you need to contact for important reasons, the Postal Service will provide the principal and perhaps the only means available for re-establishing such contacts. Welfare offices and post offices, stations and branches which are still functioning after an attack, will furnish persons whose regular post offices or home addresses are no longer usable with two types of important cards with instructions for filling them out. One is called a safety notification card. The other, an emergency change of address card. The safety notification card should be completed and mailed promptly to the last known address of those whom it is important for you to contact. This is primarily a means to advise them of the emergency address where you can be reached. If there are not enough safety notification cards available, you may use ordinary postal cards or letters for the purpose. Only one emergency change of address card should be completed and mailed. This should be done at the same time you complete and mail safety notification cards. The emergency change of address card should be addressed to the postmaster at the post office where you normally received your mail at the time of the attack even though that post office is known to be out of operation. The Postal Service will use the information on that card to forward all mail addressed to you at your former address. It is imperative, therefore, that the emergency change of address card be filled out completely and accurately. Both of the emergency cards, as well as other essential letter mail sent from disaster areas, may be mailed without postage. Except for these forms and essential letters, the only other postal service available to the general public will be the mailing of ordinary letters up to eight ounces in weight. All other postal services will be suspended except the mailing of medicines and hospital supplies destined for disaster areas and mail sent by or to federal, state, and local governments and civil defense agencies. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message on fractures and splinting. Perhaps you should make some notes on the information that will follow. If you need to get pencil and paper now, we will pause for a moment while you do. First, be certain the injured person is breathing. If he's not, then take immediate action to restore breathing. Next, look for and control bleeding. If you suspect a broken bone, treat the case as a fracture. Apply the splint without moving the person if this is possible. He should not be moved unless his life would be further in danger. Prevent shock, further injury, and infection. Make the splint secure enough to prevent any voluntary or involuntary motion at the point of fracture. Check the splint ties to be sure that the circulation of blood is not interfered with. Use anything that is rigid enough to support the fractured body part as a splint. This might be wood, metal, tightly rolled newspaper or magazines, whatever is available. 
the splint should extend beyond the joints above and below the fracture. Otherwise, the joints will move and disturb the broken bone. An open fracture is one with the end or ends of bones protruding through the skin. It is more serious than a simple fracture because germs may cause infection in the wound. The bone end may not remain visible, but may slip back under the skin. It may be necessary to straighten a limb slightly in order to apply a splint. Support the broken bone with your hands, one above and one below the break. Have another person grasp the end of the limb and exert a strong, steady pull to straighten it. With an open fracture, allow the bone to slip back under the skin when the limb is straightened. Do not attempt to push the bone end back in. If available, apply a sterile bandage to control bleeding and to keep out germs. Otherwise, use a clean shirt or towel or other clean material. Bandage the dressing firmly in place, then splint. A broken collarbone may be indicated by a lump and pain in the area of the collarbone. The bone may be immobilized by putting the arm in a sling and binding the arm close to the body. Make a triangular bandage and tie the ends around the neck. Let the fingers dangle outside the ends of the sling. Broken ribs may be indicated by sharp chest pains. Strapping the chest with long strips of adhesive tape may relieve the pain. Start strapping from above the fracture and continue down the chest wall. Start and finish the taping on the unfractured side of the chest wall. If adhesive tape is not available, use three or four inch wide strips of sheeting or whatever else is available. Have the injured person expel the air from his lungs while the binding is being applied. If you can't finish the job quickly, let him take a small breath and exhale again. Then complete the strapping. Fractures of the back mean danger of injury to the spinal cord. The edges of the broken bones may cut the cord, causing paralysis or death with movement. If the patient must be moved, place him on his back on a stiff board or a door. His head, back, and legs should be kept in a straight line at all times. A fractured neck also means danger to the spinal cord. The head, neck, and shoulders should be kept in the same relative position in which they are found. If the injured person must be moved, one person should hold the head steady so that the neck will not be bent. He should also be transported on his back and should be placed flat on his back in bed. His head should be immobilized using soft but firm material such as small sandbags on either side of his head. He must be kept in this position. Never yank on a fractured bone. Use a steady, firm pressure. If the upper leg is fractured, use a splint extending to just below the armpit. If you have any publication or booklet on first aid, be sure to refer to it. In case you missed some information during the instructions on fractures and splinting, we are going to repeat it. An open fracture is one with the end or ends of bones protruding through the skin. It is more serious than a simple fracture because germs may cause infection in the wound. The bone ends may not remain visible, but may slip back under the skin. It may be necessary to straighten a limb slightly in order to apply a splint. Support the broken bone with your hands, one above and one below the break. Have another person grasp the end of the limb and exert a strong, steady pull to straighten it. Don't yank on it. With an open fracture, allow the bone to slip back under the skin when the limb is straightened. Do not attempt to push the bone end back in. If available, apply a sterile bandage to control bleeding and keep out germs. Otherwise, use a clean shirt or towel or clean material. Bandage the dressing firmly in place, then splint. A broken collarbone may be immobilized by putting the arm in a sling and binding the arm close to the body. Make a triangular bandage and tie the ends around the neck. Let the fingers dangle outside the ends of the sling. 
Broken ribs may be indicated by sharp chest pains. Strapping the chest with long strips of adhesive tape may relieve the pain. Start strapping from above the fracture and continue down the chest wall. Start and finish the taping on the unfractured side of the chest wall. If adhesive tape is not available, use three or four inch wide strips of sheeting or whatever else is available. Have the injured person expel the air from his lungs while the binding is being applied. If you can't finish the job quickly, let him take a small breath and exhale again. Then complete the strapping. Fractures of the back mean danger of injury to the spinal cord. The edges of the broken bones may cut the cord, causing paralysis or death with movement. If the patient must be moved, place him on his back on a stiff board or a door. His head, back, and legs should be kept in a straight line at all times. A fractured neck also means danger to the spinal cord. The head, neck, and shoulders should be kept in the same relative position in which they were found. If the injured person must be moved, one person should hold the head steady so that the neck will not be bent. He should also be transported on his back and should be placed flat on his back in bed. His head should be immobilized using soft but firm material such as small sandbags on either side of his head. He must be kept in this position. If you have any publication or booklet on first aid, be sure to refer to it. Remember, be certain the injured person is breathing. If he's not, all other actions should be put off until breathing is restored. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message on farm and ranch operations. Radioactive fallout from the recent nuclear attack on our country may be dangerous in your area, but ranchers and farmers can resume operations after certain precautions are taken. Specific answers on when to resume operations after nuclear attack will be provided by your local or county government. United States Department of Agriculture specialists will work closely with your government to provide you with the latest information and advice on farm or ranch operations in your area. If you do not receive word to leave shelter within a few days, look outside. If rain or strong wind has not occurred since the attack and clean surfaces appear abnormally dusty or are covered with sand-like particles, your area probably received heavy fallout. Remain in shelter. Attempt will be made to inform you when it is safe to leave. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message for ranchers and farmers about providing safe water for livestock. Radioactive fallout can contaminate unprotected water supplies and make them undesirable for livestock. Your livestock should not be given access to unprotected water supplies if safe water is available. Water from covered springs and wells will not be contaminated by fallout and will be safe for livestock. Your watering trough should be covered when not in use. Avoid use of water from surface runoff as it is likely to be contaminated. Your livestock can go for some time without food, but an adequate supply of water is essential. If you are not sure about the safety of your water supply, remember it is better to provide whatever water is available than not to provide any water for your livestock. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message for farmers and ranchers on the protection and care of livestock. Farm animals, as well as people, can be injured or killed by radioactive fallout. Take advantage of any protection you can give the livestock on your farm. Some of your farm sheds and buildings can be adapted to protect livestock against fallout. Remember that livestock under any kind of shelter has a better chance of surviving the effects of fallout radiation than those not sheltered. Large barns with full haylofts offer considerable protection, particularly if soil is piled against the walls. Open cattle sheds offer some protection by keeping the fallout off the animals and by preventing them from eating contaminated feed. Even keeping livestock in a fenced corral or feedlot 
will help prevent the cattle from eating contaminated forage. Trench silos, potato silos, and roadway underpasses can, with a little modification, offer good protection for cattle. A two to three foot barrier of soil thrown up in front of the open end of a shed or other shelter will help lower the amount of dangerous radiation to which the animals could be exposed. Anything that keeps fallout off the animals or away from them will help. Put your milking dairy cows and valuable breeding stock in the most protected place you can find. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message for dairy farmers. Dairymen, you can reduce the chance of damage to your herd by protecting against the effects of radioactive fallout. Radioactive fallout is hazardous to the lives of your cattle and also can result in contaminated milk. Keep your dairy cattle in the barn until told by your local or county government that it is safe to leave them outside. If possible, milk them regularly. Feed only roughage and grain that has been protected from fallout. Any feed or roughage that is under cover will be protected against contamination. If you don't have enough clean roughage for all your cattle, give the uncontaminated feed and roughage to your milk cows. Because the danger in radioactivity goes down rather rapidly, roughage that has been contaminated will be usable in a few days. Your local authorities will keep you advised on this and when it will be safe to start using pasture and feed that may have been exposed to fallout. Your cattle can live for some time without food, but they will soon need water. Water from covered springs and wells will not be contaminated by fallout and will be safe for livestock. Your watering trough should be covered when not in use. Avoid use of water from surface runoff as it is likely to be contaminated. If you are not sure about the safety of your water supply, remember it is better to provide whatever water is available than not to provide any water for your livestock. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message for farmers and ranchers about when to go back to farm and ranch operations. Radioactive fallout can blanket large areas. Exposure to radioactive fallout can be extremely dangerous to you and your livestock. If you are told to take cover or to go to shelter by your local government, do so. You and your family should move to the most protected place you can find and stay there until advised it is safe to come out. If you have time, give your livestock as much protection as possible against fallout. If you will not be able to look after them, leave out food and water for their use. Radioactivity of fallout decreases quickly. Within a few days, your local government probably will tell you where and what farm operations you can engage in. As soon as you are told it is safe to do so, take care of your livestock. They will need uncontaminated feed and water. Listen to your local emergency broadcast station for the latest advice on when to resume farm operations. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message about controls and directions established by the Interstate Commerce Commission over railroads, inland water carriers, motor carriers, and the movement of passengers and freight. This message does not involve the use of your privately owned automobiles. To repeat, this message does not involve the use of your privately owned automobiles. The Interstate Commerce Commission's emergency transportation mobilization orders are presently in effect. All 13 of the emergency transportation mobilization orders are in effect. Surface carriers and shippers are required to comply with these orders. If additional information or assistance is needed, contact the nearest surface carrier or a field office of the ICC. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message about the discontinuance of emergency controls and directions which were previously established by the Interstate Commerce Commission over railroads, inland water carriers, motor carriers, and the movement of passengers and freight. The Interstate Commerce Commission's emergency transportation mobilization orders are no longer in effect. To repeat, all 13 of the ICC's emergency transportation mobilization orders 
are no longer in effect. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message about the National Defense Executive Reserve Unit of the Interstate Commerce Commission. The Interstate Commerce Commission's unit of the National Defense Executive Reserve is activated. All ICC reservists are activated. Executive reservists are now duly authorized representatives of the ICC and should proceed to assign duty posts if any have been assigned. Other ICC reservists should commence to determine the capability of surface transportation resources in their local areas and assist in directing local transportation operations. This message only concerns reservists of the Interstate Commerce Commission's unit of the National Defense Executive Reserve. It does not concern other National Defense Executive Reserve units or military reserve units. I will repeat this message. The Interstate Commerce Commission's unit of the National Defense Executive Reserve is activated. All ICC reservists are activated. Executive reservists are now duly authorized representatives of the ICC and should proceed to assign duty posts if any have been assigned. Other ICC reservists should commence to determine the capability of surface transportation resources in their local areas and assist in directing local transportation operations. This message only concerns reservists of the Interstate Commerce Commission's unit of the National Defense Executive Reserve. It does not concern other National Defense Executive Reserve units or military reserve units. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message for people in the transportation industry about the control of motor transport vehicles. While the state of civil defense emergency is in effect, the director of the Bureau of Operations of the Interstate Commerce Commission has the authority to control the movement of commercial transportation vehicles. When necessary, he or other commission employees will direct the movement of motor transport vehicles without regard to ownership or assignment in order to provide vehicles to meet emergency transportation needs where they are inadequate. Any motor carrier can be ordered to deliver or accept empty motor transport vehicles to provide a supply of vehicles where they are needed. When and where the need for motor transport vehicles to meet emergency requirements is greater than those available, any person having possession or control of any commercial motor vehicle will operate the vehicle only as directed by the Interstate Commerce Commission or shall lease, charter, or rent the vehicle to such person or persons as the Interstate Commerce Commission shall direct for the purpose of meeting emergency transportation needs. However, no such temporary vehicle assignments will be for more than a period of 15 days without the consent of the owners. Unless prior agreement is made between interested parties, the Interstate Commerce Commission will determine the fees involved. This does not apply to motor transport vehicles owned, controlled, or operated by the Department of Defense. This order is not applicable in any territory or possession of the United States. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message for people in the transportation industry about priority intercity transportation for government personnel and mail. While the state of civil defense emergency is in effect, use of commercial intercity transportation will be regulated by the Interstate Commerce Commission so that priority will be given to defense personnel and mail. Therefore, for the duration of the emergency or until further notice, each surface carrier for hire that is operating intercity passenger service will give priority over all other traffic to the transportation of uniformed or civilian personnel of the armed forces of the United States in official travel status, to military recruits or selective service personnel in travel status, and to federal or state personnel traveling on civil defense or other civil mobilization assignments. Where necessary, the number of other passengers carried will be limited in favor of those government personnel in priority status. Each surface carrier transporting United States mail in connection with intercity passenger service will give priority to the mail over all other cargo except baggage of passengers being transported. I repeat, this is the United States emergency broadcast system with a message for people in the transportation industry about priority intercity transportation for government personnel and mail. 
While the state of civil defense emergency is in effect, use of commercial intercity transportation will be regulated by the Interstate Commerce Commission so that priority will be given to defense personnel and mail. Therefore, for the duration of the emergency or until further notice, each surface carrier for hire that is operating intercity passenger service will give priority over all other traffic to the transportation of uniformed or civilian personnel of the armed forces of the United States in official travel status, to military recruits or selective service personnel in travel status, and to federal or state personnel traveling on civil defense or other civil mobilization assignments. Where necessary, the number of other passengers carried will be limited in favor of those government personnel in priority status. Each surface carrier transporting United States mail in connection with intercity passenger service will give priority to the mail over all other cargo except baggage of passengers being transported. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message about authentication of emergency broadcasts. The United States Emergency Broadcast System has been activated by direction of the President of the United States because of a grave national emergency. The Emergency Broadcast System comprises all communications facilities designated and authorized by the Federal Communications Commission to operate during a period of national emergency. Broadcasts over this system will provide emergency information and instructions by local, state, and national government officials. All stations not authorized to remain on the air as part of the United States Emergency Broadcast System have been instructed to go off the air. If you are not tuned now to a station in your area, turn your radio dial to an EBS station operating in your area. The Emergency Broadcast System stations will be easy to identify because of their repeated announcements of the area they are serving. The emergency broadcast system will carry presidential messages from the national command post as they are broadcast. Locally programmed broadcasts from the emergency broadcast system will provide you with news of the situation and emergency instructions for your area. Keep listening to your radio for further announcements which will be made over the emergency broadcast system. Do not use your telephone. I repeat, the United States Emergency Broadcast System has been activated by direction of the President of the United States because of a grave national emergency. Broadcasts over this system will provide authentic emergency information and instructions by local, state, and national government officials. Keep listening to your radio for further announcements which will be made over the Emergency Broadcast System. Do not use your telephone. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message about the use of radio during the emergency. It is not known at this time how long people will have to stay in fallout shelters. The shelter time will vary in different parts of the country. While you are in shelter, and for a period after it is safe to emerge from shelter, your only means for receiving information may be the emergency broadcast system. In each shelter, someone should be assigned to monitor the broadcasts of your local emergency broadcast station. This job can be rotated among several individuals. If you have more than one battery-operated radio in your shelter, just use one radio at a time and save the batteries of the other radios. It is vitally necessary that you keep listening to the broadcasts of your emergency broadcast station. I repeat, if you have more than one battery-operated radio in your shelter, just use one radio at a time and save the batteries of the other radios. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message from the Emergency Health Service to all persons with an Emergency Health Service assignment. The Emergency Health Service is activated. Physicians should report to their emergency assignment posts as soon as such movement is authorized. Other health personnel should also report to their emergency assignments as soon as possible. If you are uncertain where to go, communicate with your state or local employment service. This message is not directed to physicians or other health personnel holding armed forces mobilization orders. I repeat, this is the United States Emergency Broadcast System 
with a message from the Emergency Health Service to all persons with an Emergency Health Service assignment. The Emergency Health Service is activated. Physicians should report to their emergency assignment posts as soon as such movement is authorized. Other health personnel should also report to their emergency assignments as soon as possible. If you are uncertain where to go, communicate with your state or local employment service. This message is not directed to physicians or other health personnel holding Armed Forces Mobilization Orders. This is the United States Emergency Broadcast System with a message about rumor control. It is in time of emergency like this that rumors start which have no basis in fact, but which can cause widespread confusion. Disregard rumors. Keep tuned to this station for official news and information. Official information is being broadcast over this station. As quickly as information is available, it will be passed on to you. Disregard rumors and tell others to do the same. The only official information that is available is being broadcast over this station. Do your part to stop rumors and reduce chances for confusion. Full information on what is going on is being broadcast over this station and instructions are being issued as to what you should do. Remain tuned to this station for official information. <laughs>